Hello, all. Uh, I want to thank you all for, for listening to this uh, presentation around how do you, as a security leader, uh, be seen as an enabler for the business and not an inhibitor for the business. Uh, so this is going to be a fun conversation. I'm going to kind of describe some of the challenges we've seen, uh, some of the ways that you can really move security from being that uh, doctor no and into being uh, part of the business that really helps grow the organization. Um, this is who I am. Um, you know, I've been doing this cyber risk quantification thing for a while now, uh, about seven years or so, and I've worked with CISOs across the globe uh, to really help them figure out how to present information in a way that makes enables businesses to make decisions. But also, you know, in, during that time and having done this now for large companies, small companies, and companies in finance and manufacturing and all over, what I found is uh, the best way to really ensure that your message is received well is to understand who you, how the message who's who's receiving this message you know we in security always get really excited when we talk about security because it's a passion area of ours i'm like you know this is really great these are the projects i'm working on this is the programs i'm doing but the business has different views of everything and so what i really want to walk you through and, and talk you through this presentation there's some different ways to think about how you make security a business enabler the goal for this conversation is really just to give you a brief introduction to threat connect in case you haven't heard who we are and then we're going to walk you through uh, really the cyber risk quantification uh, conversation that we talked about obviously this is a recording so the q a piece i might ask a question and then i'll get to answer it as well too lucky you um, but if you have any questions or comments, I think my contact information is at the end of this. Please feel free to reach out and ask me any questions you want. I'm happy to help. So just a quick overview of Threat Connect. Uh, I'll let you read that on the right-hand side here. Um, so myself, I joined Threat Connect a little over a year ago when they made an acquisition of the cyber risk product we were building. Uh, and I happened to join a great company, right? Um, they have a great uh, threat intelligence platform, been around for a long time. These guys are really you know, top-notch in terms of their both thought leadership and execution on the product as well too. Um, built a, so built a, they built a, an orchestration, a SOAR product on top of that as well too. So you can really start to, to bring those two worlds together. And then they picked up ourselves, the risk quantification tool. And that's really kind of unique because what we end up with is this concept of a risk threat and response strategy. And quite simply what that means is it means that risk and threats kind of go together, which makes sense, right? If you have a risk, you know, maybe a risk to the business that says, well, if we have an outage from a, from a cyber attack, that's really bad. Well, are we seeing threats that relate to that? And if the answer is no, then that risk can have a different level of mitigation uh, techniques. If I'm seeing threats, though, that are maybe to my data storage, and it might not be to my, uh, you know, production systems, that's really bad from a financial perspective. How does that, how does risk influence how I manage those threats? And so bringing risk and threat together with the ability to automatically respond is absolutely critical for changing security. You'll notice in this conversation, we're gonna talk mostly about the business of security. And that's really what Threat Connect is, is, is built now to, to solve with this risk threat response is how do you change security from what it was into what it needs to be, which is a risk driven or business driven conversation. And you can see all the cool stuff as well too, lots of awards and that's always important, um, but it's really about how do, we help, how do we help businesses understand security better and move their programs forward. So as I mentioned, we have three products uh, in our suite and our portfolio. The first is our Q, and we'll talk a little bit more about that one uh, today because that's our risk quantifier product, which is focused on putting dollar value to cyber risks. We have our threat intelligence platform, which is really that central repository and enabler for, make, for, for gathering all that information and acting on it. And then we have our orchestration and automation platform, which is really focused on supporting security operations and the response and ensuring that you can scale both you know, both the team you have, but also reduce the time you actually uh, spend on tasks that can and should be automated because it's really critical with the number and the quantity of things that we have to deal with as security professionals that we're automating in the right way. So when we started thinking about this conversation and we've done this conversation uh, before, uh, did it with a CISO friend of mine a few weeks ago and it was really kind of an interesting thought process we went through. So if you think about it, if you think about security, most of the time, when you, when, you, when you think about cyber risk quantification, we put our security hats on and we say, well, how can we present this to the executive? What can we, what can we show uh, you know, the board and executives about cyber risk? What, and, but we think about it from our perspective. And what, I, what we really wanted to do here is flip this paradigm around and say, 
yes, that is important to understand what you can communicate up. But the best communications are ones where the communicator and the communicatee uh, understand each other. In other words, I can have a great conversation. I can I can make the best pitch in the world. I can say the best best things. And if it misses my target, my target doesn't understand it, it was not the best conversation. It was not the best flow of information. So what I wanted to do, we'll walk you through here over the next few slides, is give you really an overview of how we've seen boards and executives think about cyber risk so that when, whoops, that was a little too quick, so that when you're having a conversation or when you're thinking about, well, you know what, my board is asking me a question about cyber risk, how, how do I get into their mindset in order to be able to understand this? And so the first part of this really boils down to, you know, if you think about it, what do they need? What does, what does a board or what do, you know, the senior executive management within your organization need to understand from security? Do they need to understand that you're putting in a new uh, SIM? Do they need to understand that you're putting in identity and access management? Do they need to know that you're running phishing attacks, anti-phishing attacks? No, I don't agree the answer is no. What they need to know is they need to understand that security is both a risk to the business, but it also needs to be an enabler for the business as well too. And so what they need to understand is that you A, have a good grasp of what those risks are. Um, and the reason is because if you think about it, if I had a nickel for every time um, a, a security executive came to me and said, you know, my, my board, the executives, the CEO, they're, they're running in, they're asking, they're reading this in the news, they're reading ransomware in the news, they're reading this in the news, they're reading that in the news, they keep asking us about this. When there was that big solar winds incident a while back, uh, it seemed like everybody, whether they had solar winds or not, was getting questions about this. And it's, and, and the security teams were getting frustrated, but they, because I, I'm not sure they fully understand that that's where boards and non-security executives get information. They get it from news, they read about it, they hear these things. And so what they need to hear from security is, here's our risk posture, here's our risk profile. These are the biggest risks that we're seeing as an organization. And here's how we're, we're working on this. Because the questions that they're dealing with, the questions that the board and the executives are dealing with, only a small portion of those are security related. Um, most of the questions and conversation the board is, is, is thinking about or working on is the business. How is the business doing? Are we competing? What's the market look like? Are we making money? Are we growing? Are we hiring correctly? Do we have the right people? And so on and so forth. They're dealing with that, the rest of the business. So one of the big reasons that security has struggled is because most of the time, the questions the board is asking versus the data that's flowing up from security aren't lining up correctly, which is why we're big supporters and big believers in cyber risk quantification, because if you can put financial information around the security data that you're presenting, you enable that organization to say, oh, I finally understand, I, I start to see this. And that's actually really important. What, what I've talked to, to boards and done, you know, done, done a lot of these presentations over the years, I think the most interesting thing for me has always been how, um, how they look at cyber risk today. And so when we started thinking about this presentation and what we wanted to share, there's been a lot of change from a cyber risk perspective. Uh, you know, the World Economic Forum recently, in the last uh, period of time, maybe last year or so, pushed and, and said that uh, cyber risk is now one of the top risks that boards and, and executives are dealing with today. A few years ago, it wasn't. They just, they weren't looking at it. But the, what they're looking at today, again, is kind of where they're getting their information from. They're looking at it from business, from the business side of the house. They're looking at companies like Equifax. They're looking at, you know, back in the day, the target attacks. Merck. They're looking at these big, um, you know, big cyber attacks, these big public breaches, and they're going, hang on a second, that's, that's really bad. Lots of reasons why it's bad, right? A, it's bad because it costs a lot of money. You know, cyber, cyber attacks are not inexpensive. They tend to be very um, damaging to the, to the company, both in the short term, in, in terms of the breach or the attack, but also in the long term, in terms of reputation damage. You know, we've seen data that shows anywhere from, I think, like 17 to 35 or 40% of customers will leave a company if they have you know, lost their data, for example. That's huge. Why? You know, that, 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 it's funny. We, we ended up calling that a market risk in our, in, in our world because it's a future loss. And it's potentially a bigger loss than any current financial impact you could deal with today. I say that because... If your projections are to grow by, you know, 10% uh, year over year, and you now have to grow 25% year over year just to get back to where you were, 
that's a huge delta long term. If you graph that out, it's it's a monstrous loss. That's how they're looking at Cyrus. They're looking at it in terms of both the current financial impact, the damage to the reputation, and also the personal liability and damage as well too. No, 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 no longer is it the security executive who's just uh, on the hot seat for a breach. It's now the CEO. It's the CFO. You know, if you look at insurance, uh, both from a cyber insurance perspective, that's a big piece of how boards look at cyber risk today, but also from directors and officers insurance. You know, if you look at the change, I mean, you know, that used to be some cyber used to be covered under um, under this, but it's under DNO, but it's not anymore. So boards are now liable for this risk. It's a hugely um, challenging issue for them, which is also why you're seeing the trend of you know more boards looking to put cyber risk expertise onto their board of directors or the board of advisors. And this last one is important because most of the time when we think about cyber risk, we're like, well, we need to report this up to the board because they're the ones making the decisions. And that's true, there's truth there. But there's truth that the rest of the business has to make decisions as well too, the executive team does. So I'm gonna give you some very tactical examples of, of some of the things that we've seen over the years. Um, let's just say you're a business and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and get through this quick because I don't want to spend all my time on this one slide. I could talk about cyber risk for days, by the way. So if you can't sleep, call me and I'll talk to you. And you can, you can, you know, hear me talk about cyber risk for days. Um, but what we're seeing is imagine this scenario here. The business says, look, we need to grow by, I'll make up a number, $25 million in revenue uh, in the next 12 months. To do that, to, to execute on that $25 million growth, we need to add these features to our current products in order to do that. So, and then and those features are going to cost us a million dollars um, to implement and get online. Security comes along and says, well, you know, it turns out that that those features you want need security, additional security, which is also gonna cost a million dollars. And the business says, well, I don't have $2 million. I have $1 million. What, what does it do? Well, if you just have that conversation, most of the time security we've seen loses. What we're seeing though is this trend and I love this is people going, well, that million dollars in security that we're that you're asked we're asking you to do actually buys down risk to the business by thirty five million dollars. So the business has a choice now. They can invest a million dollars to get twenty five million in revenue, or they can invest a million dollars to buy down risk of thirty five million in revenue. What should they do? It depends. It depends on the business, right? But at the, for the first time, the, it, we're, we're seeing the executive team, not just security. But that executive team can now make a decision. Is it more important? Do we need to make sure that we're prepared for you know, the changing market and we have to get these features out? Or you know what, we can't take the cyber risk because there's other stuff going on within the business. That's why the rest of the executive team needs to understand cyber risk. And that's the kind of questions they're thinking about. They wanna know if I've got X dollars to spend, can I spend it on revenue increasing items or should I be spending it on security from a defensive posture? And that's, and that's absolutely critical for both the board and the rest of the executive team to understand. So how has this changed over the last few years? I, you know, um, this is one of my, I, I give our marketing team credit for coming up with that picture or finding that picture. I love it, right? I mean, <laughs> email, um, you know, uh, I think I, I, I will admit this and my mother I know will not listen to this webinar, but I actually taught her three days ago, how to send uh, an attachment in an email. You know, uh, honest to God, uh, she did not know how to do that. thought that was hysterical. But security risk and, and cybersecurity is changing as well, too. I, I think there's been a couple of watershed moments uh, in my mind for why and when did they start looking at uh, security more closely. And I'll go back to Target. I think Target was probably the biggest game changer uh, um, in, in, our, in, our, in our world from a cyber risk perspective. Yes, they lost a lot of money. Um, no, my wife didn't stop shopping there. She paused for like a few weeks and then went back. And there, if you, in, in fact, that's a really interesting piece because if you look at the data, the data shows that most, most companies who deal with a cyber attack have a dip in their market value if they're publicly traded, but very shortly after that returns quickly. Now, what happened at Target was the CEO had stepped down. And, 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 and again, I think from the business perspective, so again, this is not a conversation about how is security looking at cyber risk. This is the conversation of you as a CISO, you as a security professional, how are people viewing what you're doing and why do they care so much? Well, they care so much now because their jobs are at risk, their careers are at risk. And that's a huge deal. It's not just the money is growing. That is a big part of this, but it is now the impact, uh, really the blast radius of a cyber attack is now the, the business itself, the finances itself, 
and the careers uh, as well too. I will tell you that if you if you're on a bigger you know if you're listening to this and you're one, in one of the bigger companies, no large company has gone out of business to cyber attacks yet. But we have seen small some semi medium you know some smaller medium companies go out of business due to cyber attacks. Literally go out of business, not be able to recover, not be able to handle this, and they're and they're, and they're done. We're not quite at the point where this happens to a large company yet, but that trend is growing. So again, executives are seeing this and they're going, hang on a second, this isn't just right. And it's funny because that change has really come because the factors that used to be top of mind were, <laughs> how much money am I spending on security? Why am I spending so much money on security? What is security, right? I mean, it used to be very uh, driven by tactical, tactical uh, realms. Um, and I think part of that has been uh, from a cyber insurance perspective as well too, right? When we talk about cyber insurance changing and, and what that looks like. So cyber insurance to me has been a, a really fun thing. And years ago, I worked with um, you know brokers and underwriters and got a good glimpse into cyber insurance. I actually got to go, I didn't get to go in. I saw the Lloyd's building with the elevators on the outside. It was very, very cool. Would like an invite by the way, uh, if you're listening and work there because I just think it's cool. Cyber insurance used to be kind of the wild, wild west, right? It was <laughs> when, a, when a company bought cyber insurance, the main criteria for buying cyber insurance was how much money do you want to spend on it? That was literally, a, you know, I heard this from brokers, underwriters, and boards. So cyber insurance played a huge role in, in both helping cyber risk get started. But the evolution of it, I, I argue, is really kind of wild. Not only are the insurance companies asking a lot more questions, a lot more detail, but they're changing their, they're changing even in the last three to six months, how they're paying out and what they're doing. I think uh, I read uh, not that long ago that I, I believe the company is AXA Insurance in, in Europe and, and they said, they're not gonna cover ransomware attacks anymore. They're not gonna cover extortion fees. They're not gonna, they're starting to restrict what they'll cover. And then if you read about AIG, they're starting to change how they're putting their policies together as well to kind of tightening the rules around this because it's, it's the, the money. I mean, at the end of the day, the money is coming. So you see, you'll see this coming top down as, as more risk gets absorbed by the business from a financial perspective, more visibility will be placed into security and it's gonna become more critical that you actually can communicate cyber risk in financial terms. So cyber insurance, I think is playing a huge role because they used to be the place where you offloaded risk. And if you, you as an organization can't offload risk, you have to accept it. And no business is going to accept large risks. They're going to work to mitigate them. So that's, I believe, I believe cyber insurance is playing a huge role in this uh, whole conversation. And the last piece of the puzzle, this is a fun one for me uh, because I've I mean, a lot of friends who are CISOs, worked with them over the years. Uh, I guess it was about four or five years ago, we were doing an event. We're having a conversation with a bunch of uh, CISOs and security executives, and it was in Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles which is really cool. Never been there. Wow, this is like really neat. Sitting around the table um, and the conversation, i never forget this conversation. Uh, the conversation popped up and someone said, one of the CISO said, why would, why would my board ever want to know financial information? I just give them my technical metrics and they're fine. Honestly, that was, the, that was what was said. I think only one or two other people stood up at the table and said, eh, no, actually they do want this financial information. Now we see the CISO role evol evolving and growing and, and being no longer just the smartest technical person in the room, but really being that business driver. Uh, and I think that's where it's going. I think the CISO role is going to become, if it's not already, the, biz the key business person around security. You know, if you look at the evolution of the IT function, you know, the, the CIO used to be the smartest IT person in the world. Now the CIO is really managing the business of IT for the organization. That's where this path for the CISO is going as well, too. And most CISOs I, I talk to see that and they, they realize that's where that's going. Still in its infancy, it's still not quite there yet, but it's definitely changing. And I think it's changing for the better. I say it's changing for the better because, you know, companies spend a lot of money on security and they don't know, A, how much is enough, B, if they're getting a good value, or C, do they need how much they need to keep investing. So I'm a big fan of seeing that CISO role evolve into a business leader role. Regulations. So this is going to surprise you, but I am a huge fan of regulations. Um, I love GDPR. I think it's, I think it's one of the greatest things that ever came out uh, from a regulations perspective, because it has actual teeth, right? I, again, if you want to influence change, you can talk to people about change. You can convince them. You can try and build momentum. 
or there can be a legal reason to change <laughs> a legal risk. And, and that's why I love GDPR. Um, in fact, I will tell you, I'm a big fan of GDPR. I love what, what, what's been done with this because it forced companies to change how they think about uh, the data that they store and where they store it. However, I'm going to kind of you know tell you my opinion on this. By the way, I, I tell everybody I'm very blunt in my assessments. I love GDPR, but it's also a bit of a pain because when we build our models around GDPR, for example, every, you know, GDPR is a European-wide uh, statute or regulation but it's applied individually at the individual government level, which makes it challenging, right? If I have, I can get fined from three different countries in Europe and the fine levels are all different. They're all over the place. It's a great first start. I can't wait till the US gets to the point where, you know, uh, folks in, in that DC area can stop talking and, you know, arguing with each other and actually do something useful like creating a GDPR regulation for the US. You know, we're seeing some of this start to pop out. New York State uh, Department of Financial Services has put its regulation forward. California's got its regulation. The SEC is starting to make more movements. Um, you know, three, four, uh, 2018, I saw them, I saw the SEC put something out that said, uh, you know, if you have a material cyber risk, you should communicate that in your 10Ks and 10Qs. That was great. Saw recently that the SEC came out and said they find a company for poor vulnerabilities. So I think that's huge. I think the confluence of where all this is going is eventually we will have a, a, um, a US wide uh, GDPR like um, regulation. And I think GDPR is only going to get better as it grows over the years and the fines can be a little more normalized. Why I think that's important to kind of normalize that is because companies are working to be compliant, but if they don't see the financial impact of this as being material, or if they see that it's very different, or if they go, well, you know, it turns out most of our data is from a country that does low, we'll take that risk. So companies are working to be compliant with this, but I think we need, you know, we need the industry and the regulators to do a little bit better job of kind of normalizing what those potential impacts are, because it definitely influences cyber risk. I remember when GDPR came out, it was like, whoo, we have to worry about this. And so that's actually really, really good. The one, you know, it, so the one potential negative when it comes to um, regulations is the old adage that compliance is not security, right? I can check the box and say I'm compliant with something, a regulation, as you, for example, but if I'm not, that doesn't mean I'm secure. So we do need to make sure that these regulations have both, I love that they have teeth, but they need to ensure and kind of encourage good security. Good security does begin with basic hygiene, and well, it is, it is that as well, too. Um, but when we've been working with boards and executives over the years, I've watched the change as GDPR first started being talked about, then it came out, now it's reality. We're starting to see more and more of this in the US and it's great. So I'm a big fan, uh, love what we're doing with regulations and actually can't wait for more, which is, I never thought I would ever say something like that, but I am a big fan of it. So I said it <laughs> and it's recorded. So unfortunately I can't hide from it. So this is my passion area. So. Uh, I was on a webinar yesterday where we were discussing cyber risk and I get into a lot of conversations with uh, both executives and sometimes we, we geek out, we have fun geek conversations as well too. I'll tell you, our definition of cyber risk is, is, there is, is the relationship between the attack and the impact. And I say that because a lot of people think cyber risk is just a financial thing. And the reality is it's not, right? It's really a financial thing co correlated or combined with uh, an actual attack. So I say that because a lot of people, when we talk about cyber risk, are like, ooh, what's the financial number? And it's a number and there is numbers there that, you know, uh, we can get fun and we can talk about distributions and probabilities and all that fun stuff. But at the end of the day, there's an average, there's, a, there's kind of that both max and average loss that people are really looking for to, to kind of drive that conversation. But those values are so dependent on the kind of attack that you're facing. So again, example, working with a large, energy company. And they're like, you know, data breach, if we get a hit of data breach, that's, that's potentially meh, because we don't really have data, but we have huge liabilities when it comes to ransomware attacks. So there, they understood that the correlation they needed to know was not just a number, but they needed to know what caused the impact in the first place, that correlation between the attack and the financial impact. Another organization we work with, a large manufacturing company, was like, you know what? We're a, a large, well, we just did the we just did the ransomware one. 
we worked with some healthcare companies as well too. And they're like, look, we're really worried about our, our data because if our data gets lost, it's a huge impact for us. So that correlation, when you, when you talk about cyber risk, you have to talk about it in terms of the attack with the financial impact. And, and that's the key thing for this. And it sounds so simple, but I, I've seen too, a lot of organizations just put a number or just put a, you know, when I say number, however you want to represent the numbers, fine, but it's not just a number. It's a correlation between a number and a kind of attack. And the reality is that's important because remember, there's, there's always three things you're going to do when it comes to risk or cyber risk in particular. You're going to have to accept some level of risk. Even if it comes to cyber insurance, you have a financial risk that you're going to absorb, it's the deductible, how much you're going to invest in this. You are going to transfer some of that risk. Again, like we talked about, maybe cyber insurance will cover some of this. That's great. But then you're also going to spend things on mitigations. And again, if you don't know the profile or the kind of attack that you're facing, there's a very high probability you end up mitigating the wrong things. So when we, when we you know, advise people, you know, both when we talk to boards and we advise CISOs and security executives to talk to boards, we always tell them to put the financial losses in context. Show the loss. So there's really three things. I, if you take nothing away from this, three things to show uh, the executives. One is the magnitude of the loss, financial magnitude of the loss. Two is the cause of that loss. And that cause is the kind of attack. And you can get really geeky if you want. You can talk about the kind of malware family that might hit the organization on and on and on. Or you can use words that the board will understand. Um, ransomware, data breach, vipers, DDoS. Boards just can understand that. You can explain that to them. Remember, most CISOs you don't, that I've seen over the years, they don't get lots of time with executives. They have to kind of condense it. So we always recommend kind of doing the walk the dog approach. Give them the, give them, or I guess I'll say this, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them the details, and then remind them what you're telling them, but keep it short and simple up front. So magnitude, the kind of attack, and then the annualized view of this, because that, that lets them see in context what's the biggest thing that could happen, why, and then uh, you know, what does this look like in the next 12 months or so. And then from there, the questions tend to come, well, what are we doing about this? What's our strategy for this? Are we able to handle this from a cash flow perspective? Do we need to go to external markets to make sure we've got back money in case we need it? What's our security strategy? Are we spending money in the right place or a resource? All these questions can flow if you present the information to the executives in a way that's clear, concise, and consumable. Three Cs, clear, concise, and consumable. I might get a t-shirt made for that one. By the way, I make a lot of bad jokes whether anybody's laughing or not. So you haven't figured that out, that's just part of who I am. Again, we talked about the, 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 the three C's, but the three pieces of, you know, three things that you end up dealing with for risk, you, you accept some level of risk, you uh, transfer some level of risk, and you work on mitigations. And I'll tell you, when we got started building our product, when we got started building our queue, our goal was really this screen here. So this screen started off as a PowerPoint on a whiteboard three, four, five years ago. Um, actually, it was more like four or five years ago. Because what we really wanted to do was we wanted to help drive the conversation that said, where should you be spending money as a, as a security organization? Not in terms of, I think this is the best product. I think this is the, the coolest technology. But in terms of how much financial risk reduction does an investment in security actually provide to the business? Because again, it's about how do you enable that business conversation for security? So when we started down this path, it's been fun. It's been challenging. But what we found is the best way to communicate this is again in a kind of standard framework based way. So we said, look, let's let's look at how does improving a control. And when I say the word control, I mean things like the NIST cybersecurity framework, you know, the CIS top 20 controls or ISO 27001. Most organizations have some kind of understanding of where they're at from a security perspective with those controls. And they want to know if they were to increase that control, what would that look like? And so we built our queue to enable that conversation to show improving a control buys down a buys down a risk by X percent, which translates into this dollar amount. And what that enables then is that enables you as a security executive to go to the business and say, look, I've got $500,000 in budget and I, or $550,000 in budget. I've got two things that I can do. I can either work on improving my asset management, which you know, is, going to, is going to give me a good ROI, or I can go in and do one of the two other things as well too. I can do two things or I can do one. Which one should we do? Well, if you do asset management, that's going to disrupt the business. We really, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of the next three to six months is key shipping time for us. You know, imagine you're, a, um, imagine you're a lawn care or you're working in agricultural and you're in South America where, 
you know, summer is coming, you need to ship product now. You really don't want to necessarily disrupt that. Let's work on the other two. It, that conversation alone of saying, well, you know, our business cycle is we need, to, we need to make sure that this part of the business runs smoothly, trying to do this piece of security now, oof, that's a challenge. Let's work on the other two. Great. That's a perfect conversation. That's the kind of conversation you want to drive when it comes to making security investments. So we think it's absolutely great uh, when we hear those kinds of feedback from our from the boards, from the executives, and even from security uh, leaders as well, too. I will tell you, and I don't think I have a slide in here, we actually ended up adding uh, short-term recommendations, prioritizing vulnerabilities by their financial impact because uh, you know people kept coming to us and saying, this is great, but I got a backlog of vulnerabilities a mile long and I can't get to them all. How do you prioritize those? Well, that's something we, we, we looked at and added in as well. So I don't think I put it in here, but... Anyway, it's just one of the fun things that you start to see when people start engaging with cyber risk in a meaningful way. But this has been the biggest piece. I will tell you, this is this last piece, and I think this we're getting close to the end here. Um, I've been talking for a while, so if you're still here, <laughs> shoot me a note. Let me know you got to the end. I'm just curious. Um, this to me is the, is the, is kind of the coolest thing. Uh, it's the what if, right? This is the biggest question. What if? What if I were to do this? What if I were to do this? Most of security, I, I think, is around this. And it, and it goes back to something I said earlier, where you know, imagine that you, know, you have that million dollars to spend. Should I spend it on the business or should I spend it on security? Well, what's the risk if somebody doesn't meet the baseline? What's the risk if I grant them a waiver? How much financial exposure am I taking on? Um, you know, how, much, how much would it actually, what would, what would happen if I were to invest more in my endpoint controls and take money away from a different control area. Because you know, if you all print money, congratulations. Most companies I know don't print money. I think that tends to be a government-y thing. So if you don't print money and you have to deal with reality, by the way, one of, our, one of my colleagues said the best line ever, he said, reality gets a vote, which I love. Reality gets a vote when it comes to budgeting. Maybe you can increase spending in endpoint controls, but you've got to decrease it in detection control. What, what would that do for you? What would that do from a risk perspective uh, as an organization? And, and what, what, what this what if capability does, is it gives you the ability to ask those questions, answer those questions. And, and it's a wide open area, right? These custom scenarios can be anything from, uh, you know, complete what if to this is what you're doing to even uh, fair scenarios as well too. If you're familiar with fair, we have that capability as well as some very cool automation built around that as well too. But that's more of a what not a why. The why is really what's wild for me. So I've seen such an uptick in this as people look at this both for investment perspectives, but also for M&A. You know, we didn't talk about that. Again, I could talk about cyber risk till the cows come home. I don't have cows, but it's just a saying we say here. For some reason, it popped into my head. Um, so, you know, I could talk about that uh, for days, but M&A is a great one as well, too. I mean, when Yahoo got bought by Verizon years ago, I think it was a couple of weeks before the deal closed that Yahoo went, oh yeah, by the way, data breach. And Verizon went, here's the price we were gonna pay, here's the price we're paying now. And that's huge, right? You wanna know what that risk and impact is before you ever get to that point. So being able to understand and measure and say, what if I were to take on this company with this kind of risk is absolutely huge and critical uh, for an organization. Looks a little crazy. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but innovation is what we do. So people always ask, how do you do this? How do you get your numbers? We are math nerds uh, and automation nerds. Everything from machine learning to statistical modeling to cyber kill chain analysis, all done in part of our queue. And I apologize for the slide not coming out well, um, but you can always pause this and, and see, take a peek at this. And if you can figure out how it all works in this PowerPoint, let me know. And I'm happy to talk to it as well, too. I will tell you our philosophy is that it's easier for people to critique than it is to create. So we build models and we put them in a product and we go, here, you tune them. Because, because again, having watched this trend over the last seven years, what I'm seeing is companies don't wanna hire people to model risk, they wanna hire people to manage and mitigate risk. And so what our queue is built to do is be the risk modeling tool for you, the automated piece of that, and then let you manage and mitigate risk, which is really what businesses should be spending their time on. Last slide, our tips for communicating this. It's so critical that we, that we communicate cyber risk in financial terms, but it's arguably almost more critical that we understand how that data will be received, even in financial terms, right? So we have to make sure that you put yourself in the shoes or in the, in the, 
in the purview, think about how the executives, you know, will be receiving and, and, and thinking about this information. Think of, you know, try and put yourself in their shoes for how do they think and what is their problems and why are they thinking like this so that you can craft your message in a way that they can very well and very easily understand. I will tell you, financial, the financial view of this is the lingua franca for, for executives and for the business. So that's kind of the baseline. What I'm really trying to suggest is think about your business and how they're looking at it so that you can tailor that conversation to meet their needs. You know, years ago, I was taught um, uh, by someone, they said, I think I said this earlier, is when you want to present information, tell them what you're going to tell them, explain it to them or tell them, and then tell them what you just told them, right? So keep it simple up front. A lot of my uh, CISO friends have been like, look, I've got five minutes with the board, you know, once a month or once a quarter, whatever it works out to be. And so they have to go, this is our risk. These are the three things we're working on. We got it. And, you know, obviously there's times there's deeper conversations, but they keep it, they keep it simple. And then they let the, the kind of the conversation flow down. And it's so challenging because we all want to go look at all this data, look at all the good stuff I'm doing. I'm just telling you, keep it simple. I've seen that work uh, very, very well. And this is another one for me, right? This is this is one of my passion areas. Um, you heard us talk about automation. You heard, you know, we're threat connected. One of our core tenants is automation, uh, especially from a product perspective. Your cyber risk changes daily. I should have put this slide in here. Years ago, we did an analysis of the Equifax attack. And we found that there was like a four day window where the exploit was published. And so uh, Equifax had a vulnerability. Somebody published an exploit along with the vulnerability. Four days later, they were exploited. Then it was sold and transferred and so on and so forth. But that, that four day window is stuck with me because your cyber risk changes way more often than you think about cyber risk. And so automation has to be applied to this problem. You have to monitor your financial exposure regularly or we're gonna be playing catch up or, or we're gonna be going back to that early part of this conversation where we talked about target and you know, a non-security executives uh, being in trouble with us. So this is something we have to be doing on a very regular basis if we're gonna not only change security from a technical thing into a business thing, but if we're really gonna truly help our organizations out. And the last thing I'll leave you with is a friend of mine who was the CISO of a large organization told me, and this is fun, because this is one of the first you know, handful of people I heard say something like this. He was a CISO and he said, uh, my job as a CISO is to protect and help the company grow revenue. That was his job and he, and he was absolutely right. Uh, and so that is our job in security and we need to make sure we're, we're keeping an eye on security on cyber risk. I told you my contact information was in here. Ha! So if you made it to the end, if you have questions and you're not blinded by the big orange sign we've got going on here, reach out to us, threatconnect.com, reach out to me directly, happy to answer whatever questions you have. Thank you for listening, it's been a pleasure. I uh, hope you enjoyed my monologue and have a great morning, afternoon or evening or whenever you're listening to this. Thanks all.